about scaling UI development with Relay. Joe, please. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon. Um, yeah, so my name is Joe Savona, and uh, today Yuzi and I will be talking about um, just you know building the, the uh, sorry the tools that we use at Facebook to develop large applications effectively. And specifically, we'll be focusing on the uh, the user interface. So our goal as product developers is to create high quality applications. But what does that really mean? And you know what that's a very you know very large topic. So today we'll focus on a few aspects: reliability. Uh, per, uh, performance and productivity. So reliability is obviously important um, because users may avoid applications that crash or have too many bugs. Right? It's, seems pretty obvious. Um, obviously, performance is, is pretty important because users are generally more engaged with responsive applications. And as developers, we ourselves want to feel productive. Right? Like we want to just we want to build new features and uh, move on with things. We don't want it to like take forever uh, to add a, a single new feature. So these are you know, probably pretty natural goals, but how can we achieve them? When our application is small, these attributes are pretty easy. Our application is like a nice, neat box. We understand everything that's in it and how it all fits together. And at first, adding new features is relatively easy. Right? We already understand the existing code, and we understand how to change it in order to accommodate the new feature. And so for a little while, things kind of go pretty smoothly, and we know how everything fits. And it's pretty easy to keep our application fast and to avoid bugs. But as our application grows in complexity and we add new developers to the team, it can become a lot harder to add new features. And it isn't quite so obvious how things all fit together. It can become more and more time consuming to add new features. And it's also a lot harder to make sure we're not introducing bugs. So you know, things can kind of get out of hand over time. OK, so let's go back to the goals and see where things can go wrong. We'll start with reliability. What makes an app reliable? Well, if you think about it, reliability means that our application works as intended. That's kind of the definition, right? Um, but it also means that when we make a change, that the change has the desired effect. So to do this, we need a solid understanding of our code so that we can make changes and have confidence that we're not introducing a bug. And being, a, being confident in our understanding of the code is difficult unless the code is predictable. We have to be able to look at the, a, a small piece of code, understand what it's going to do, and understand how any change we make will affect our application. So having predictable code is, a, is really, really critical here. If, we're, if we can't predict the result, we're probably going to write a bug. So really, building reliable apps comes down to making our code predictable. So let's look at how we can do this in the user interface. So you've probably seen this example if you've, ever, if you've seen any talks about React or Flux. But I'll just go, th I'll go through it really, uh, really quickly. So consider the message icon. It's a you know, small, uh, small piece of the Facebook uh, interface. But even this small piece of UI can appear in three different states. Seems maybe not so bad, right? Just three states, how hard can it be? Um, but with imperative approaches to UI development, we don't think about three states. We think about six different transitions between the states. And if we get any one of these transitions wrong, we've introduced a bug to our application. Again, maybe not so bad for a smaller application or for a small piece of UI. But when we get to really big, complex applications like Facebook.com, the transitions get a little bit hairy, and they kind of start to seem like that. So things can get you know, a bit intractable. So this is why we created React, to make user interface development predictable. React takes a declarative approach to UI development. Instead of imperatively thinking about transitions, we define our UI as a function of state. So going back to the message icon, we can create a, a component that's effectively a function that, given some input, returns a description of the UI. When the input's 0, it returns this, uh, this UI. With a different input, returns a different UI. So now we're back to thinking about states. I can, I can look at the code for this component and just look at, OK, if the, if the input's 0, it's going to do this. If the input's between 0 and 99, it's going to do this. If it's over 99, it's going to return this. Three states. It's a lot easier to reason about. So this lets developers focus on what the UI should be and not how to achieve it. React takes care of the how. It takes care of the, the, uh, the transitions for us. And these components are composable. 
to build a larger piece of UI like this, we already have a message icon, right? And we might have a, a friend request icon and the notifications icon. So we can take those three components, put them into a new larger component that takes some data, passes that data into each individual component, aggregates their results into a larger piece of UI. And from this, we can then go on to compose larger and larger pieces of UI until you can effectively have a single, uh, app, you know, a single component that's effectively defining your entire application. So declarative components are more predictable. It's easier to reason about each of them in isolation, helping us to make more reliable applications overall. So this separation helps larger teams work on applications too, because each developer can focus on a single component. They don't have to keep the entire UI in their head. They can just focus on one small piece. So, so far we've talked about the view, and React has been really powerful at allowing developers to build um, really complex user interfaces much faster. But what about data? Going back to our example, the data has to come from somewhere, and in reality, that's gonna be a server. It, ensuring that data fetching is correct is actually a pretty hard problem, right? We're dealing with a network. Requests might fail. They might arrive at the server out of order. Uh, there's things like retries, error handling, a lot of complexity around transitions between what happened before and what happens next. The same kind of difficult transitions that we had to sort of deal with, with uh, in, the, in the view. And typically, developers have to re-implement this network handling logic all over again for every new product. So this was a significant source of friction for our developers, and let's see why. So a common approach here is to use REST endpoints for fetching data. We'll start with a really, really simple ap application. It just shows a list of notifications. Now with REST, and I'm gonna kinda do like a sort of pure REST, and you, know, you can nitpick my definition, but just bear with me. The notifications list might fetch data from a notifications endpoint. And this shape here is just indicating that the, this endpoint is returning the sort of data that's expected by the corresponding list, right? We're just gonna get a list of endpoints, not the actual uh, data for each item. So once we have the list, we can then go and kick off new requests to actually fetch information about each, uh, each notification. Get that data, and then render the item. So these REST endpoints are reusable because we could build a new UI that fetches the same list of notifications and displays the data in a different way. But for even this simple application, there's already two problems. The first is that our endpoint has to stay in sync with the view. If the view expects some new data to be available and the server doesn't return it, something's going to break. Second, we only have two components here, and yet we're already introducing multiple round trips. This might be OK if we're on a desktop uh, with a really fast connection, but on a mobile network for a mobile device, this is probably going to be too slow. So in reality, people t kind of probably end up more commonly with custom endpoints. Going back to the notifications list example, we might create just a new endpoint, right? Notifications with data. And it'll return, as you can see, we've kind of put the shapes together. It returns both the list and the, the data needed for each item. We get the data back, and we can render everything. Great, right? Pretty performant. The data's in one place. Kind of pretty easy to reason about. But it's not quite so simple, right? Because over time, we're gonna end up creating new endpoints. We realize that, oh, we've got to, we wanna show the notifications and messages, but we wanna fetch them efficiently, so we'll just put all that together. Oh, and then we wanna show a summary of the notifications somewhere, so we'll create a notifications with summary endpoint. Finally, we realize that, oh wait, our app has to have more than notifications, it probably needs a homepage, so we'll build a homepage, and notifications are a part of that, so we'll just reuse that logic and stick it in that endpoint too. And then a whole bunch of other stuff, right? So over time, we end up adding more and more endpoints. And as you can see from the colors, right, this, the data fetching logic is duplicated all over the place. And again, we still have to keep all of these endpoints in sync with the views so that things don't break. So in our experience, these approaches just simply didn't allow us to move fast enough and didn't deliver enough performance for our applications. Developers were forced to re-implement complex error-prone logic, and it was too easy to write a bug. Right, this is just like, do you really want to write like hundreds of endpoints? Like that's crazy. So taking inspiration from React, we developed a new framework called Relay. Relay brings declarative data fetching to React applications. 
Uh, we're using it on the, uh, re, uh, with uh, React for Web and on our React nati uh, native applications. And today, we're announcing that Relay is open source and available for download on GitHub. <laughs> so uh, for the rest of the talk, we'll kind of look at Relay and how it works and some of the high-level concepts. So going back to our notifications list example, Whereas before, we saw that the data fetching logic was encoded on the server, right? Remember those, these little uh, weird shapes were on the server endpoint. Now you can see that we've moved them into the components. So each component actually specifies what data it needs. And this is using the GraphQL uh, language that we've also uh, open sourced. And Nick Schrock is giving a talk on GraphQL on this track later today. So uh, GraphQL is a declarative query language. The server publishes a schema, all the things that a client can query. And the client specifies what subset of the data it wants in order to render uh, the application. So this means that we can move the data fetching logic or the data uh, dependencies into the components. So notifications list says, this is the data I need. The notification uh, item component specifies the data it needs. Relay can then extract this, uh, th these queries from the components and send it to the server. So again, GraphQL knows it, it's already defined how to uh, handle the, the data fetching logic for any of, for any you know arbitrary query. So it's a single generic custom endpoint. Or sorry, a single custom a single endpoint. It's effective, but it kind of acts like a custom one, right? We're just creating a new endpoint every time we send out a query. GraphQL can resolve this data, send it back to the client, and then Relay can take that data, put it into a cache, and then use that to fulfill uh, the rendering for the entire application. So with this, we've kind of gotten the best of both worlds. So Relay brings kind of really two, two main benefits. Predictability. We can look at each component, and we understand two things. What data it needs to render. And second, how it will display that data once it's available. So just as React lets us focus on the what, what should our UI look like, and the framework handles the how of actually making the UI do that. Relay also does the same thing. We, we think about the what. What data does our, does our application need? And Relay will actually go through the, the hard work of figuring out what data it already has, what data is missing, sending a query to the server, uh, retry logic, things like that. It also makes it easier to build performant applications. So Relay batches queries together. We saw how it extracted all the queries for an entire view, lifted them into a single query, and sent it to the server. So um, just like with custom endpoints, we get the, 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 the benefits of a single round trip. Next, I'm going to hand things over to Yuzi, who's going to talk in more depth about Relay. Okay. So Joe talked about how frameworks like React and Relay makes it easier to write predictable predictable code even when applications become really complex. He also talked about how Relay enables data, fed data to be fetched in a single round trip with GraphQL. I'm going to explain a few more ways that Relay can help to make apps faster and more reliable. So let's say we're starting to build this shiny new application from scratch, and everything worked great in the beginning when the app was simple. But as we continue to iterate and add more features, uh, we might see a little bit more of this. So the problem here is as applications increase in complexity, they can require more data, and fetching that additional data can slow down the app. Ideally, we can increase in complexity of the app without incurring longer and longer fetch time. But unfortunately, there's a limit to how much faster we can fetch a certain amount of data. After a while, it would just be diminishing returns. But just because it takes more time to fetch the data for the entire app doesn't mean we can't start rendering some of these components first. With incremental rendering, we can fetch and render the most important components on the page first. Uh, and by allowing certain parts of the app to render faster, we can improve the overall perceived performance of the app. And I know this is not a new idea, and there's many apps using it today. But nevertheless, let's take a closer look at how that can make the app feel more speedy. So the total time it takes for an app to fetch, fetch its data is roughly equal to the amount of time it takes for the server to generate the data, plus the amount of time it takes for the data to be transferred over the network back to the client. So I actually want to focus on this network piece here. Um, generally, 
the client's network speed is a limiting factor here, and it's also something we don't really have control over. To make the matter worse, the network time could greatly dominate the server time on a slow connection. And if we have to wait for all the data to render, that means the more data the app needs, the longer it's going to take, and the slower the app can be. So how do we work around that? Well, the idea is pretty simple. We can get the server to send down smaller chunks of data, and then we can start using these smaller chunks of data that hopefully took less time to fetch um, to render some of the components first instead of waiting for everything. Um, the idea might be simple, but there's still some hard questions um, we have to answer. So for example, how are these data chunks defined? How granular should each data chunk be? And also, how do we prioritize the different data chunks? So who has the answer out to all these questions? In this case, it's the developers writing the app. They're the experts on what data should go together and also which components should be uh, fetched first for the best user experience. On the other hand, the framework should make it easy for developers to express how, these data sh how the data should be split up and the order that they want to receive these data chunks. And if that information is co-located in the component, like the data requirements, it's very natural for developers to implement the views that can handle the loading states for each data chunk. And then the framework, such as Relay, will be able to help batch, coordinate, and process chunks of data for these components. So that's how we can render a single view incrementally, and that can increase the user performance. However, most applications are going to have more than one view, and navigating to new views should be fast as well. So like I mentioned earlier, there's really a limit to how much faster we can fetch a certain amount of data. But what if we can just reduce the amount of data we need to fetch for all the subsequent views? Let's consider a case where I open up Facebook to read my newsfeed. And if I get a notification, I might navigate to the Notifications tab. And when I'm done with that, I might head back to Newsfeed to continue reading. But wait a minute, did I just load this newsfeed two seconds ago? We really don't have to go to the server for this data again. Furthermore, different views can also share a significant amount of data. So when I click into the Photos view from Newsfeed, a lot of the data inside the Photos um, view, such as the image, the, light, uh, the description, and the light count, was already previously fetched in this Newsfeed view. So if we can leverage the data we already have, we'll be able to request less data. And in some situations, we could even completely skip fetching data from the server, and we can save our entire round trip. So requesting less data will not only help reduce the amount of time it takes for the server to generate the response, and also the response will be a lot smaller, which means it will take less time to send. And both of these can help reduce the overall fetch time. And um, as a common approach to solve many problems in computer science, we can, tr we can introduce a form of caching here. And we will have the opportunity to speed up the app by orders of magnitude whenever we can reuse data from cache instead of having to go all the way to the server. I'm going to go over two ways this cache can be used, one imperative approach and one declarative approach. So in the imperative approach, each component will need to interface directly with the cache. Each component will need to know how to read data from, properly from this cache. And if all of its data's requirements are available, um, then the component can render right away. But if not, the component will need to know how to figure out what data is missing, how to write a request for the missing data, how to send the request to the server, and then how to merge that um, newly fetched data with what was retrieved from the cache. And all this custom logic can be very error prone and can result in both overfetching and underfetching. And even when all the data is fetched for the component, it still has to update the cache, and otherwise, future components won't be able to take advantage of what was fetched before. So, um, Relay actually takes a more of a declarative approach. In this case, a tree of components will simply go to the caching layer and say, I want this data. The cache will then go through the query and try to match up data with what has been stored previously. And then it will generate a query for the missing data and send it to the server. When the server returns with a response, we'll store that new resulting payload. 
and then the cache can hand the requested data back into the component in their expected formats. In this approach, we only fetch what's needed for this new view, and all this optimization is pretty much done for us. Developers no longer have to worry about how to generate uh, the query for the missing data, and it's also a lot better to have a lot of these complex logic inside one well-tested framework instead of trying to reinvent the same logic within each component. Okay, so everything we talked about up to now is about how to read data. But what about writing data to the server? There are a number of ways users can interact with an application, and some of those interactions can, may result in a write. On Facebook, these actions can be liking a story, commenting on a story, or maybe a sharing a link to a friend of yours. And in Relay, we refer to these actions as mutations because they mutate the data we have. And whenever one of these mutations occur, the data we have locally uh, may become stale, and the view and cache must be updated after a mutation in order to be clear to the user that his or her action took an effect on the server. So let's take a look at some of the approaches to handle mutations on client. In this first approach, we send the mutation request to the server. Um, it would just include information like, this user just liked the story. The server endpoint here is, going to, is pretty simple. It's just going to return a yes or no on whether the write was successful. Then we'll need some logic on the client to know how to transform this Boolean result into the right set of updates. And then use the set of updates to overwrite the cache. This can work if the mutation is very simple, but we often notice that one simple write on the server can have multiple downstream effects on the client. So generating all the right updates for these fields can be very difficult. Going back, um, let's look at the liking a story example again. So let's say I click on the like button. I expect the button to, to turn blue. So that's effectively just toggling a Boolean. It's pretty straightforward. And also expect the light count to be incremented from 12 to 13. Uh, which again, incrementing a number, also very easy to do. But if the view is showing Kathy and eight others like this, this is also known as a like sentence. Um, it can be updated to, or it should be updated to you and nine others like this. And the thing is, I can probably hack something together for the English version, but there's no way I'll know how to um, change this, make this internationalized correctly to all the different locales. But I do know that the server knows how to generate this data. So as it turns out, Boolean result isn't always very useful, and we really have to get some sort of updates from the server to support a wide range of mutations. So how do we get this data from the server? Based on what Joe talked about earlier, we know that uh, shared REST endpoints may mean multiple round trips to the server. We also know that custom endpoint may quick, can quickly get out of hand. So let's just request data with a GraphQL query. We can write out a query with a list of fields that we want to update whenever the mutation happens. And to save a round trip, we'll just send this query up with the mutation request instead of waiting for a yes or no. Then the server will perform the mutation and I resolve the query and send back the data corresponding to the query. The client can then use this data to overwrite the stale data on the cache. And this is actually how the very first version of mutations worked on Relay. So in the beginning, it worked out pretty well. Um, we had this view, and, or something that looked like this view, and then we hand wrote uh, that query to update the like count and also whether the current viewer likes the story. So when I click the like button, um, it will turn blue, and also the light count also increments correctly. So, but a few weeks down the line, we decided to switch it up a little. So instead of showing the like count, we we're showing this like sentence. So now, when I click the like button, it turns blue, but this like sentence is never updated. And that's because we never updated our handwritten query to include this new field. So suddenly, the view is showing me inconsistent information, and things like this can make the app feel unpredictable and unreliable. So with this approach, we'll have to remember to keep updating all the fields um, that were mainly ri written anytime we make a view change. And that can be hard to remember and pretty error prone. And keep in mind that complex applications can have many mutations. And trying to keep all those manually written queries up to date um, is really hard to scale. So we need something better. 
what we can do about missing, so what can we do about missing some of the updates? One possibility is just automatically request all the data. There's no way we can miss any updates this way, right? But then, you know, the server will have to generate a lot of data, and most of which probably didn't even change from this mutation. And then on the client, we'll have to process all this information that didn't change, um, and just doing a lot of unnecessary work, and that can make the mutation slower than needed. So this is also not really optimal. What we really want is to be able to update our local cache with only the data that changed. So let's take a look at how Relay handles mutations. Intrinsic to each mutation is a set of fields that can be changed by this mutation. And on the client, we can figure out what data we have in the cache and we'll like to keep up to date. And by intersecting them, we can figure out the exact set of fields that was both changed by the mutation and needs to be updated on the client. So let's take a look at a more concrete case. So let's say this is a set of the field that can change when we have a story like mutation. And let's say this is the set of data I have on the, um, on the client about the story. And just as a side note, um, this query is generated systematically based on what we have in the cache, and it's not uh, written by hand. So if a view requirements change, this will automatically reflect those changes. And by intersecting them, we find that only these two fields need to be updated after this mutation. And so the server sent this payload down um, to the client, and then we'll apply it. And note that we didn't really get any of the fields that didn't change. So for example, we didn't get author, messages, and also attachment, because we know those fields couldn't have been changed by this mutation. Also, um, we're not getting the like sentence, because the client currently doesn't care about this field. So we don't really need to get a copy of it, or old or new. And this is really the minimum set of data that client can receive and still be up to date. So if two weeks later, we decided that we want to update our component to render a like sentence, the cache will know that these are the new fields that we care about, and the intersection step will make sure to include the like sentence instead of likers count. Now with this approach, we no longer have to keep the view and mutation queries in sync by hand. We can also reliably expect all the fields to be updated properly. And since there's no extraneous data being sent or received, we know that this can be fast. So um, in conclusion, with both Relay and React, we notice that declarative APIs can result in code that's more straightforward to understand and gives developers more confidence in their code to make predictable changes. Also, it can be more performant because now we can build optimizations directly into the framework instead of relying on each developer to optimize their own components. And as a result, developers are less likely to be boggled down with bugs or worrying about how to do something. They can spend more time focusing on the product that they're making. So I know even though Relay is a JavaScript framework and not everyone in the audience here codes in JavaScript, but these concepts and ideas can be applied to other languages and platforms. And in this talk, we only covered some of the cool features that Relay has to offer. So if you would like to learn more about Relay, you can find us on GitHub.